financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vani Podcast. And welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm Shane and... I'm Jason. Since government to the primary coercers upon individuals, this podcast and everything found on the website is covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. And we do encourage it uh, as long as you're not a bludgie. Uh, we obviously want to get uh, the message of Vani out there. And, uh, you know, sometime see a Vonu Association or Vonu community come into fruition. So the only way to do that is to, uh, you know, bring this uh, podcast and the information in front of the eyes of even more folks. So please feel free to do anything you want with our podcast, uh, anything on the website, uh, as long as you're not a uh, government agent or bludgy. So uh, as an update for the listeners, Kyle is back and uh, all appears to be well. Uh, but Jason and I are going to uh, keep recording. Uh, he stepped up when we needed him and uh, he's done a lot for the podcast. So... Uh, and obviously, as I've said before, he offers a lot of valuable insight uh, and uh, I think a very uh, interesting perspective. So uh, that said, welcome back, Jason. Uh, how are things going? Uh, you know what, Shane? It's a little tough today, but nothing I can't get past. How are you feeling? I'm doing quite well, actually. Doing quite well. I uh, uh, got, uh, yeah, th- I mean, nothing is uh, really different, but uh, I'm really excited. Uh, my brother and I are going to go out uh, tonight and uh, look at some stars and galaxies with a telescope we've had for for three years, but we've never used it, so we're going to go out and give her a go. So, excited for that. That sounds like fun, actually. <laughs> that sounds oh, like yeah. a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. You know, as long as we can fi- as long as long we can figure it out. I, I, okay, I guess to, 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 I guess to re-say that, I did try once right after we got it, after I put it together, but I didn't know what I was doing. So, I sat out there for like 30 minutes, didn't see anything, and just went back inside. So, this thing sat for another three years or so. So, we're going we're gonna to give it another shot. So... <laughs> We'll see. We'll see. It's a, it's a nice telescope, so it's supposed to be uh, for, for beginners, so uh, we'll find out how true that claim actually is. And if we can't figure it out, there's uh, always YouTube, right? So uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll figure it out. So uh, this episode is titled Pursuing Venuance in South Chile, and the show notes can be found at vonipodcast.com forward slash intermission nine. So the title pretty much describes what we'll be, uh, you know, discussing. Uh, but as a brief preview, we will be covering a few articles from Ocean Freedom Notes, uh, nine and a half, July 1989, originally published in Living Free Number 12, April 1981. Uh, specifically, Islands of South Chile, An Untamed Frontier by Jem Stum, Self Liberation Ways, The Burrow Smiths of South Chile by Rayo, Comments, uh, and lastly, Comments on Burrow Smith Lifestyle, again by Jem Stum. So, I understand this may not be practical or even an option for most listeners, you know, pursuing venues in South Chile, but regardless, these articles provide a very interesting perspective. Uh, if, even if just for uh, entertainment value alone. Um, but, uh, you know, that this strategy and kind of the things discussed could be transferred to other, uh, you know, Vani pursuits uh, or, you know, st- strategically relocating to other areas. So, so Jason, we get to deal with Jim Stum again. Are you excited? Yay, Jim. City Jim. That's what I'm going to call him from now on. We get to deal <laughs> oh, with yeah, C- I forgot City Jim. Yeah. Yeah, so I messaged, uh, I, was, I was starting to, uh, or I, was, I got back into digitizing uh, survival gardening notes, uh, and uh, right off the bat, you know, on like the second page, uh, or again, yeah, like the second article, he admits that he lives in the city. So uh, all of his claims leveled against Rayo, uh, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think I think I think Jim was dealing with a little bit of the uh, city psychological pressures that Rayo discussed. Uh, so I, I I think his his uh, his his attacks that he leveled against uh, Rayo I think are even more disingenuous now uh, than uh, than even we previously thought. So yeah, City Jim. That's him. So, so, yeah, there's definitely some uh, confirmation bias there for, you know, some comfort bias also. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I, I don't blame him. I don't blame him. I mean, I, I live in the city still, um, unfortunately. Uh, as I've said before, I do plan on, you know, uh, well, actually, in a couple of years, I will be homesteading down in southern Illinois. Um, but, you know, I, I do understand, you know, getting used to the uh, the accommodations uh, of, of the city. I think in some in uh, some of these articles and in the, in these publications, uh, it's called the like the it's said multiple times the seduction of the city lights, which, uh, you know, that's a very common phenomenon. So I don't uh, you know, I don't blame Jim. I just wish uh, he would have been, uh, you know, more honest with his critiques. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can understand him, too. You know, I, I do enjoy my cable Internet. 
Uh, I, I do enjoy some some creature comforts of the city, but uh, you know, if, if Jim had been a little more upfront, then uh, I, I could I could I could have more respect for his word. Right, right. But uh, anyways, uh, anyways. Uh, so so yeah, we'll have to deal with Jim again, and and this is going to be an example of, you know, I I've, I've we've been very we've been pretty harsh on Jim in the past. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, in, in some of these publications, especially Ocean Freedom Notes, uh, he offers some very, very, I think, pretty pretty incredible uh, insights. I really do. Uh, he wasn't a stupid guy. He definitely was not. Uh, so uh, I think you'll kind of uh, you glean that, glean a little bit of, of that from uh, our discussion today. So uh, anything else before we get rolling? No, nope, let's get going. Okay, so again, this is uh, from Ocean Freedom Notes 9.5, uh, July 1989. And this is... Uh, I think I'm having trouble keeping track of all these publications now. Uh, I think I'm waiting on the first portion of this to uh, to be proofread, and then I'll get this out. Uh, but yeah, it's not published as of right now. Uh, there's going to be over the next couple of weeks, guys. There's going to be a lot of new publications coming out. Uh, I guess we've kind of hit a lull. Uh, not really a lull, but uh, you know, I guess it's the calm before the storm. I guess is uh, one way to put it. So, um, so yeah, Ocean Freedom Notes uh, nine and a half from July. Uh, 1989. Let's get to it. Uh, this article is titled Islands of South Chile, an Untamed Frontier. Quote, on the west coast of South America, from the south shore of the of the island of Chilo at 43 degrees south latitude, all the way to Cape Horn at the tip of Tierra del Fuego at 56 degrees south, a vast labyrinth of islands and steep-sided fjords extends for, a th for thousands of miles. This region has been mapped only from the air and sea and otherwise remains largely unexplored, unsurveyed, and unpopulated. This region from Chilo to Porto Natales, a town population 11,500 at the northern limit of T del Fuego, which is a distance of about 600 miles, comprises the Chilean province of Azen. The entire province had a population of 48,000 in 1970, almost entirely on the mainland. The provincial capital is the town of Azen on the mainland river of the same name, which had a population of 7,140 in 1970. This is the most populous settlement uh, in the province. Uh, and quote, we'll stop there for a moment. To get people an idea of what we're talking about, for, for those that may not be that familiar with South Chile, and I wasn't uh, until I read uh, this publication. So uh, to give you an idea here. Um, so obviously Chile is on the uh, southwestern portion of South America, and uh, it abuts Argentina uh, there to the east. Uh, and the location that we're talking about, probably, I'm going to say halfway down, uh, maybe more like three quarters of the way down uh, Argentina and probably about 90% uh, of the way down Chile. Um, kind of get into this uh, this very interesting area. Uh, and he's going to describe in further detail momentarily uh, just what, what kind of that, uh, that consists of. But it's a very interesting region. Uh, glaciers uh, around uh, the, the climate is uh, quite chilly. Uh, you know, quite uh, Chile, I guess you could say. Uh, pun not intended. Uh, <laughs> but uh, a very interesting region, and I think uh, for for people who uh, for Venuans who are looking to strategically relocate in kind of that wilderness Vanu kind of uh, direction, uh, you know this is uh, definitely a uh, possibility. Uh, anything there, Jason? Uh, yeah, this this region um, it is extreme south, right? So you're going to have extreme temperature swings. Uh, like the the best that I can describe it as is. Um, like the uh, the the west the west coast of British Columbia, the southern panhandle of Alaska, right? You have you have all those islands there, like go, going up the coast, like just off the mainland. That's it's it's very similar to this to this island to these sets of islands uh, in South Chile. Um, they're not not none of them are huge, but they are all uh, of size. They are all obviously very rocky. They are, you know, on the ocean. They are not connected to the mainland uh, in any real way. Right, right. And 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 uh, one of the things he's going to mention here is, uh, you know, co coming up, which I, I, you know, I thought of a, a, it made me laugh last night. But apparently, you know, no roads can be built in that area for, uh, for for a reason he'll describe. But uh, uh, you know, the question came to mind: but who will who will build the roads? Well, not the government in this case. So, uh, <laughs> thank goodness. Yeah, yeah, thank goodness. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think it'd be a little bit of. Uh, a little bit of a waste, uh, as I don't see a lot of. Uh, uh, and you know what's what's interesting too about this location? If you go on Google Maps, or I I, I download Google Earth to, to look at this more specifically last night, and uh, you know these are very good places to uh, to go because the the locations that Jim references in this article you can't find half of them. So even Google doesn't know where they are. 
Uh, so I think just on that note alone, I think you're 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 going to be uh, pretty well off. All right, let's get back to uh, back to the article here. Quote. One reason settlers have been slow to move into this area is because the broken terrain with steep mountains, fjords, and some glaciers running into the sea makes it impossible to build a road running, running the length of the province. A motorist has to cross the Andes and travel north or south through Argentina. On the Chilean side, the only way to get from Chilo and points north to places in Azen province or to uh, Puerto Natales and points south is by air or by sea. On these islands themselves are only settlements... Uh, on these islands themselves, the only settlements that I have been I have seen mentioned are Malinka on Ascension 1, with a population of 450, uh, P. Lagunas on Melkor 1, which has a radio station, and P. Eden on the east side of Wellington 1, which has a weather station and seaplane base in the 1950s, which was a weather station and seaplane base in the, in the 1950s. Uh, in addition, there, there may be a few villages of Alkaloo Canoe Indians, uh, although they numbered only about 300 in 1950 and were dying out. And in certain seasons, one may see a few fishermen and otter and seal hunters along those shores, uh, end quote. So Malinka, you can find that on Google. And I would recommend, uh, you know, get open Google Maps where you're listening to this or, you know, uh, you know, make a note for later to do so and figure out what we're talking about. But Malinka is kind of on the very northern point of the area that we're talking about. So, you know, very, very south Chile. I guess another thing I found interesting was, uh, you know, uh, Jason, those those tribes that have never been... Uh, like the tribes deep in the deep in the jungle that have never been, you know, introduced to you know technology. Those very primitive tribes. Uh, I have a feeling those uh, those uh, Indian tribes there uh, in those areas, uh, or if they if they are still there, are very much uh, you know along those same lines. Oh, absolutely. The the accessibility, as I said, the accessibility here is no roads, right? So you either you either have to fly in. Um, or or boat in, and if you boat in, then you have to be able to get out of the boat, right? I mean, these are rocky shorelines, so you have to find a beach. I, I, I keep I keep coming back to this to this idea of Alaska, um, the, the the western coast of Alaska, and and the south west coast of Alaska. I mean, these they're, they're, these are are largely largely you, there, there's no real way to get there. Right. I mean, if, if if you if you have a seaplane, you can land you can land on a lake or something, or or uh, a glacier if if it's frozen over and and whatnot. But the accessibility, just just the the ability to get there with any sort of measurable supplies. I mean, if if you if you get there with more than your backpack and, and a few days rations, I'm going to be surprised. Right. right I mean, you're gonna right. you're gonna you're gonna have to bring in like multiple multiple plane loads. Um, and in order to have any sort of in any sort of uh, sustainable um, sustainable habitat, right? I mean, if, if you can't, the the extreme cold here, you're gonna have to either have a really, 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 really good tent, or you're gonna have to build some sort of structure. And if you build some sort of structure, you have to have the tools to build that structure. In order to have the tools, you, well, you have to bring them in. Right. 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 And these these aren't. You know, this, it's not something that you're going to do with your with your pocket knife and your leather band and your little folding saw. No, and and another yeah, I guess, yeah, you'll you'll basically have to be almost completely self sufficient in this area. Uh, import export is pretty much going to be non-existent. We'll look at a, a hypothetical story uh, or a hypothetical proposition by Rayo. Uh, you know what that's uh, some family uh, could do uh, in this area. But uh, another point too, and I I don't remember where in this publication or it might have been a different one. I'm having trouble keeping track, guys. Uh, but Apparently the uh, that western coast where we're talking about uh, that of South Chile. Apparently it's uh, the the waves are uh, I, I guess uh, the the waves are uh, you know make it difficult for a boat to even get there. Uh, one of them recommended uh, one of them said that you could probably do it you could probably do it fine, but you have to have a motor. Like you can't just sail in there. Uh, you've got to have a motor to get in there, as far as I understand. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, the, 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 what, what could happen to you if you don't, uh, you know, successfully uh, find a place to land, uh, I mean, you, your boat could get shot up against the, uh, against that uh, rocky coast, and that would not be fun for anybody. Uh, so yeah, I think the, the, main, the most important points here, it's uh, import-export is pretty much non-existent, and uh, <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to be uh, pretty much completely self-sufficient. Uh, so anything else there, or you want to move forward? Uh, on, on the import-export thing, I mean, if, you know, Perfect scenario, absolute perfect scenario. You know, you have money, right? You have the ability to set up, bring in regular supplies and, and that sort of thing. And 
As I said, money's not an issue. The weather, the extreme of the weather, uh, the 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 storms come. This is on the coast again. So the the storms come in out of nowhere. The storms come in with intensity, blowing very hard, uh, very very wet, very very cold. Um, and you these these storms. I mean, they're not you know little afternoon drizzles. I mean, they'll they'll come in and and blast for four or five days. Um, at, at, I don't I don't know about the the weather here in Chile. But the weather in um, the Gulf of Alaska and, and in the Berlin or the Berlin Sea, what the heck is it called up there? <laughs> I'm not sure. I guess I can. <laughs> um, um, the the ocean between Alaska and the United States, uh, Alaska and Russia. I mean, Bering, hold on. Bering Sea, maybe. Bering Sea, yes. The 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 large storms that come in on the Bering Sea are akin to the hurricanes in terms of force and ferocity that hit Florida and and the southern southeast United States. They don't call them they don't call them hurricanes in the, in the Bering Sea. They're just storms. And I I can't imagine the weather that is hitting these islands on South Chile really being any different. Right, right. And I guess to speak to uh, your your uh, your perfect scenario. Uh, I mean, yeah, that would kind of be the only way for import export if you have a plane and you can find a place to put it. Uh, you know, concealed preferably, obviously, if you're going to be pursuing Vanu. Uh, you know, that would be you know kind of the ideal situation. But then again, uh, when it comes to to Vanu, if there's a plane traveling, you know, in and out of that area, uh, once a month, oh, yeah. that might raise some concerns. Uh, because no one really goes there. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure you could do it kind of concealed. But again, if uh, if you're going I don't, I don't really know how that would work out. Uh, I think, uh, you know, and if, if anyone's going to pursue this, I doubt they're going to, you know, have enough money to even to even pursue that route. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm still kind of reverting back to com basically complete, complete self-sufficiency. Uh, so that's, I think that's kind of the baseline here. If uh, you're one of those uh, crazy wilderness folks that can, that can do that, and I mean crazy in a good way, uh, then yeah, this, uh, <laughs> this, uh, this might be a possibility for you, but let's uh, go ahead. Uh, and uh, move forward here. Uh, the climate on these islands is cold and wet. These mountainous, misty islands are covered with a dense forest of both evergreens and deciduous species. In some places, bamboo grows in impenetrable thickets, and an abundance of thorny shrubs also impede surface travel. These woods are home to numerous birds, including, among others, hummingbirds, parakeets, and woodpeckers. The mammals found here include deer, fox, opossum, puma, and various rodents. Along the coast, one finds fur, fur seal, sea otter, and nutria, similar to beaver, which have valuable fur and seabirds uh, and shellfish, end quote. So as far as stuff that you could survive on, uh, those are some pretty good options. Uh, really sounds like some pretty good options. Um, so yeah, if you, if you uh, can, can hunt, that'd, yeah, that'd be uh, probably the only way you're going to get your food, right? So um, an interesting, uh, I guess, a little animal species there. Uh, yeah, the... the um... The opportunity for for trapping is is very high there. When you have when you have small prey animals, um, I, I'm I'm sure I'm sure there, there's more mammals than there's just that because it is a uh, both deciduous and evergreen forest. Um, that is a wide variety of of trees. It's it's so it's it's going to have a wide variety of animals. Uh, so you you could eke out a living, uh, trapping, hunting, uh, that sort of thing, but. Hell, fishing too. <laughs> well, with, with fishing, yeah. I mean, if if you could get a boat in the water where, where you're at, um, you I guess you could fish off the rocks. Um, yeah, there, there's there's yeah. got there's uh, got to be there's got to be some low points where you could where you could manage that. So uh, there, there's got to be. Um, I, I yeah, I don't know for sure, but uh, but yeah, I, I would say probably the best route would be fishing off of uh, uh, if there's uh, some sort of a low coast or something like that. But I mean, yeah, there are possibilities for food in this area. Uh, but again, uh, basically uh, complete self-sufficiency. So uh, back to it. Uh, quote from the islands of Chile on south, uh, South Chile. This region includes the Chonos Archipe uh, Archipelago, which runs for 130 miles and includes thousands of islands. Below that lies Taitao Peninsula, which is almost uh, an inland, uh, an uh, almost an island, since it's connected to the mainland only by the narrow isthmus of Ofqui. The southern shore of the Taitao is washed by the Golfo de Penis, uh, Gulf of Troubles, a turbulent bay where many ships have been lost. No outlying island shelter, islands shelter this coast, so the waves roar in unimpeded from the open Pacific and from Antarctica one, uh, thousands of miles away, end quote. So, 
And there we have our proof. Uh, so no outlying islands shelter this coast. So the waves roar in unimpeded from the open Pacific and from Antarctica thousands of miles away. So uh, I think your comparison to uh, to the uh, Bering, Bering Bay or whatever it was in Alaska, I think it's a pretty good comparison. Only probably, you know, maybe even more severe. I don't know. Yeah, the... Uh, um... The, the Aleutian Islands, that's that's the chain of islands that, that goes southwest uh, off the coast, off Alaska. Um, yeah, there's there's very little ports. There's there's very little uh, occupation. I mean, there's there's like an, an old World War II base, <laughs> you know, going going back to, to that far. And there's actually like a Japanese base on these Aleutian Islands. It's, it's like the only U.S. land that they ever actually occupied. Uh-huh. Um, so I mean, the- theoretically, people have existed out there, but the ability to exist out there and limit your coercion—that's that's that's the that's the big thing here—is is limiting your coercion. You can exist out there with help from the servile society, but to exist out there and live a limited coercion lifestyle is hard. It's yeah. very hard. Yeah, I can't even. I, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. Ronnie, we're not even talking about uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, just living without without electricity. We're talking that this is gonna be, this is, this would be a pretty hardcore venture, uh, and uh, you know, I don't think there were many of those folks, uh, you know, back in Rayo's day that would do this. I think there are even fewer of them now, uh, <laughs> because you know, honestly, honestly, for folks that do want to pursue that, there are probably better options, right? Uh, you know, just going up to uh, to, to Canada uh, as, a, as a favorite, or just the ski region. Uh, but yeah, this would be a very, very hardcore pursuit, uh, and I don't think many people would uh, would, would want to uh, you know uh, do that. But at the same time, it's still an interesting case study, I suppose. Uh, so, anything else there, or should we uh, go ahead and wrap up this uh, first article by Jim? Oh, let's let's keep going. This next paragraph has some good points in it. Yes, it does. Quote: uh, South of this Gulf, one finds mostly larger islands with even fewer people than this few uh, than the few who live on the islands of, uh, north of Taitau. This area has been described as a vast maze of islands and channels where there is no sign of human life to intrude upon the grandeur and desolate solitude of nature. These are more uh, these more southerly islands often run to several hundred square miles in area and they rise up to a couple thousand feet. The largest island in this area is Wellington, which is 100 miles long by 15 to 25 miles wide and has a highest elevation of 3,300 feet. Wellington is, a mo- is mountainous and has glaciers, swamps, and forests. Fjords deeply indent its coast. There is a tiny settlement named Porto Eden on Wellington's east coast, but it is otherwise uninhabited. Further information on the major islands running as far south as the Strait of Magellan is given in the table uh, below in the original publication. Um, there are still other uninhabited islands lying south of the strait in the province of Tierra del Fuego, but since they haven't, since they have an, an even harsher subantarctic climate, we needn't look too closely at them while these other islands lie empty and unused at more temperatures, uh, more temperate latitudes further north. End quote. So that's, yeah, you're exactly right. Some interesting stuff. Uh, Wellington is mountainous and has glaciers, swamps, and forests. So uh, very interesting uh, description there. Yeah, it, it's very. I, I keep going back to Alaska. It's it's it, sorry. It's it's what I know, right? So I, I keep going back to Alaska. Alaska has this wide variety uh, of of mountains, swamps, uh, deciduous and evergreen trees, a wide variety of wildlife, um, and it just like if if you were to you know flip the flip the north and south pole over, like this could be Alaska down south, right? It's it's the the same terrain, the the same. Um, uh, the same environment, the same weather, the lack of people in the in this area tells you exactly how how harsh the environment is. I mean, it says right here that uh, harsher sub sub Arctic climate. Like, if, if you're if you know Alaska at all, you know north of the north of the Brooks Range, uh, you're looking at like negative forty degrees in the winter sometime. You know, and, and if you get wow. if you get more north of that, if you get more north of that, like up into the up into the Arctic Circle, like they have to the the oil rigs up there, like they have to run their vehicles twenty four hours a day in the winter, or the gasoline in the tanks freeze. Gosh. <laughs> okay. Wow. I mean, I, this is it. I, there there are people that work on these rigs. Like, if you 
if you don't wear like full protection, if like if your face is exposed, the wind, the the wind chill factor alone can cause your surface skin to freeze. Gosh, I bet that okay. I bet I bet I, they get pretty paid pretty well to to do that. <laughs> That's a yeah, harsh job. Yeah, has, hazard pay. Hazard pay. Gosh, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if it gets that if if it gets that cold uh, in this area, but it, it would be cold nonetheless. Which you know, as as Rayo tends to uh, tends to promote here, uh, he what he was he's talking about say a completely underground dwelling, which I think man would probably be one of the only ways to to I guess comfortably survive in this sort of climate uh, to utilize that uh, vigorous internal temperature to uh, you know keep it uh, keep it at a uh, you know a livable uh, temperature range. Uh, because it would not be uh, it would not be a, a very comfortable life if you're just in a uh, in a uh, in a polyethylene a tent there uh, far more harsher than uh, uh, than the Siskiyou region. But I, I, I'm 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 very curious about these Indian tribes that may be there. I I I, I don't know. Like I, I didn't maybe they uh, you know rode on a boat that like you know kind of ended up in there on a canoe you know sometime uh, you know uh, I guess on accident and uh you know they couldn't get off so i get did they just uh, you know decide that uh you know they had to survive there or they would just die out i mean uh how did these indian tribes get there uh it's a very interesting question it absolutely is you know and, and and it does give a lot of food for thought but there are there 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 are there are uh ideas here you know like like as you said that they did um uh, move out there, you know. They, they did. They did li move off the mainland, you know, to get away from another tribe, or uh, maybe that they were living there and there was a big earthquake that caused all these things, um, or ca caused all these islands. I mean, th there's there's a lot of ideas there. Right, and it, you're right, and I, I suppose the I, I suppose the the climate may not have always been that way. Yeah, obviously, natural factors like earthquakes might have you know uh, drastically shifted the the geography of the location. Uh, so yeah, I guess that uh, that might factor into it too. You know, they they, they might have had ancestors. You know, at, at one point maybe they had a population of 5,000 there, and uh, you know, in the night, I think it was 1970. You know, down to 300 or less, and they're dying out. You know, I guess that yeah, that's that, that is possible and certainly something interesting to ponder. Um, I guess maybe maybe I'll look into that after the show. Uh, but I, I highly doubt there's uh, much information on uh, <laughs> on any of these tribes that may have existed. Uh, but uh, anything else there? Nope. Let's keep going. All right, so this article is uh, titled uh, Self-Liberation Ways, the Birthsmiths of South Chile. Uh, and Jim says, quote, the following is part of an article by El Rey, uh, Rayo, which is published in Innovator, Autumn 1969. This lifestyle description is a composite and extra, uh, extrapolation, not a description of actual existing persons, end quote. So this is not, uh, he's not describing a real family here. Uh, this is just a hypothetical scenario that he kind of, uh, you know, whipped up. The Burroughs Smiths want complete independence, but believe they believe that with enough knowledge and initial equipment, they can self-sufficiently maintain late 19th century technology. They also believe there is no substitute for distance from the American Leviathan and other coercive as power centers. They have secretly constructed and furnished a large underground home and workshop beneath an uninhabited island on the southern coast of Chile. Their facilities include dry dock storage with well camouflage entrance for an old 60-foot sailing vessel, in summer, some of the Burroughs Smiths sail to small, isolated communities away from their immediate area, where they offer repair services not locally available. This provides a small but adequate income source, initial equipment having been paid for out of savings. The Burroughs Smiths eat staples plus seafood and what they forage on nearby islands. They are also experimenting with underground hydroponics. The cold, wet climate and a desire for unblemished concealment preclude service agriculture. For power, they have a small hydroelectric plant. They produce charcoal for smelting. The island is heavily timbered. They hope eventually to find ore deposits nearby, but in lieu of, in lieu of that, will carefully salvage and reclaim their own worn-out equipment, plus what they scrap, plus what scrap they find in their travels. The Broad Smiths want isolation from what they believe is a dying civilization, but to hedge their bets, the isolation will be in one direction only. Children become fluent in several languages and dialects so that they may pass easily within both Anglo and Latin countries. In form, the family is a modified line marriage perpetuating relations suggested in Robert Heinlein's The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Many adopted, as well as biological children, assure a large genetic pool. When they become too numerous for a single base, they intend to duplicate key equipment, separate into two groups, and launch a second similar community elsewhere." End quote. So, uh, very interesting uh, little example there. I guess the, the first note, uh, you know, as we kind of discussed, I don't know if you could get a sailing vessel 
uh, without a motor into that location. So I guess that'd be the first point. Uh, not quite sure how that would work out. Uh, secondly, you know, as, as Rayo tended to be, he was overcautious, and that's not a bad thing. But you consider one of these uninhabited islands, you could easily get away, and I think Jim actually argues this, that you could easily get, get away with planting some trees and some vegetables above ground if you wanted to. Yeah, you, I, I don't think there's any concern there, right? Uh, the only concern that I would have would be, again, the, the weather. Um, it, I, I, I know that in, in summertime, in their summertime, the, the Southern Hemisphere summertime, as in, as in Alaska, uh, the angle uh, of the Earth shifts and they have daylight uh, for a substantial period of time uh, in a good, you know, given 24-hour period. Um, so you could you could grow uh, humongous vegetables and uh, uh, root vegetables and, and things like that, cabbage, uh, squash, uh, etc. Um, and being being so isolated, the amount of air traffic that they would see going over their said island or their said area would be very very min minuscule. I mean, there would be very very few planes flying over. My concern right here, uh, they talk about uh, a dry dock storage. That means you have to move the 60-foot sailing vessel, right? So for, first you have to ha find someplace low enough that you can get a 60-foot sailing vessel to the shore. Then you have to move said 60-foot sailing vessel. If, if this was entirely done underground, uh, as they say, the the... The dry dock being underground, it has to be close enough to the water for the sailboat to get there first, and then they have to move it inside the dry dock, in which is entirely underground again. So it's not <laughs> this is this is not a small cavern that they're hiding this in, right? This no. is a, a, a how, how do you six... how do you find like how do you find a cave like that or something uh, where you can actually You're... that I, yeah that'd be that'd be difficult. And I think too like if. if if uh, you know the Burrow Smiths were trying to find a location, they only had a sailing vessel. If they were investigating some of these coves and things, I imagine there would be you know st they might get stuck in one of them uh, if, if they if they can't get like, you know I, I think that's a possibility too. So I, I think this is I think there's some it, it, it's an interesting example, but I think there there are uh, a number of issues with it. That being one of them. Yeah, they're trying to hide a bus underground. It's <laughs> a good way to put it, yeah. The 60-foot sailing vessel, and and again, it has to be close to the water. This is the this is the coast, right? This is this is un uninterrupted waves coming from the Pacific Ocean and the uh, Arctic Ocean, right? So, I mean, this is also again uh, South Chile, right? This is on the Ring of Fire. I think it's on the Ring of Fire. South, yeah, I think it's on the Ring of Fire. Um, so there are earthquakes, there are tsunamis, there are rogue waves, there are storms that come in and double, triple, quadruple the size of the normal coastal waves, right? So if, if you have a dry dock that is underground with a, you know, a, essentially a bus hiding in it, you're going to have these waves crashing into your dry dock. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure he will. And, and, you know, I wish Jim would have put the entire article here. This is only a portion of it, but... Uh, but yeah, you know, this one, this may be one of the times where, and you know, maybe this is something that Ray was developing or just kind of lay it out there like, hey, here's a hypothetical example. If you want to, if you want to try to try that and do some of the different things, go for it. But yeah, this one uh, just seems a little, uh, a little out Extreme. there. Now, now I will say, yeah. I will say the, uh, the underground structure, I, I think that that'd kind of be the only way to go, as I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, so I think that's good. And then also hydro, hydroelectric power, uh, that probably wouldn't be too hard. Uh, I wouldn't imagine. Uh, so I think there are some so there are some 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 good things uh, in this uh, in this scenario, uh, but yeah, I think it's uh, <laughs> so def definitely some issues. Now let's talk about uh, the 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 last paragraph here. Uh, the inform the family is a modified line marriage perpetuating relation suggested in Robert Heinlein's The Moon Is a Horse Mistress. Uh, so I don't know much about that. Uh, Jim goes into it a little bit in the next one, but just to provide a definition here for. Uh, for the listeners, and this is a uh, Wikipedia, it's for group marriage, but line marriage is mentioned. I'll go ahead and just read a little bit here. Quote, depending on the sexual orientation and activity of the members, all adults in the family may be sexual partners. For instance, if all members are heterosexual, all the women uh, may have sexual relationships with all the men. If members are bisexual, they may have evolved sexual, sexual relationships with either gender. 
Group marriage implies a strong commitment to be faithful by only having sex within the group and staying together long term. This, the group may be open to taking on new partners, but only if all members of the family agree to accept the new person as a partner. The new person then moves into the household and becomes an equal member of the family. Uh, currently, the most common form of group marriage is a triad of two women and one man, or two men and one woman. They are the polyfidelitous families formed by two heterosexual couples who become a foursome and live together with a family. Uh, now, line marriage uh, is a form of group marriage found in fiction in which the family unit continues to add new spouses of both sexes over time so that the marriage does not end. So, uh, I don't know. What do you think, man? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure about this. How how are you going to add new members to the group while limiting your coercion, right? You you have you have to go out to the community, right? You have to go out into the city, into the towns to find new people and then talk them into this. Yeah, this this is a little more <laughs> radical than hey babe, you want to come out to the Siskiyou and, and take a ride in my polyethylene A tent? This is a little different than that. It's hey, you live in this you know this, you know this normal you know city in Chile. Do you want to come out here to this uninhabited island and live underground with my with my line marriage family? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, come come live with me. Let's go on a date with me and my four brothers. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I don't see any rational woman <laughs> signing up for this at all. No, no, I don't. I don't think so. I, I don't. I don't think so at all. Uh, so let's see what, uh, let's see what, uh, what Jim Stum had to say. Comments on Burrow Smith lifestyle. And this, I think he makes some very, very good points. Uh, kind of what we've already, uh, we've already mentioned here, but, uh, he goes a little more in depth. So he says, quote, concealment on a South Chilean island does seem feasible since there are thousands of islands along the 600 mile coast, which are heavily wooded and almost entirely uninhabited. Of course, contact with the authoritarian Chilean government must be absolutely avoided. I'm reasonably certain government forces don't set foot on these islands. Probably probably accurate uh under the under the thick tree cover uh avoiding discovery by air should be easy but i would guess that the channels are patrolled by government gunboats especially the sheltered inside passage between the islands and the mainland so that's the area of greatest risk a secret home probably should be located on the seaward side of these islands and even so it would be best if one's boat could be hauled up on land and concealed that would be easier to do with a boat smaller than the 60 footer mentioned mentioned above uh and cool stop there yeah i think that'd be easier uh, that's what I was thinking whenever, you know, hiding, hiding a boat, like a small boat, you can just pull up on shore. Because you can't, I don't think you can pull up a 60-footer on, on shore. Uh, <laughs> I just don't think you can. But, uh, you know, I think this this initial paragraph by Jim is accurate. I think that's, uh, that uh, probably, yeah, that, 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 that's a good point. The fact that if there's a passage that leads to the mainland, which would, you know, make uh, the, the nation state, uh, would, would that be, that'd be a matter of defense? You know, I could see them uh, patrolling that very small area. But... Uh, but yeah, any other islands, I think you're, it should, should be very, very easy uh, to avoid uh, avoid um, uh, avoid detection. I think it'd be very easy. Oh yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there were there were tribes of, of Eskimos of, of Native Alaskans that were largely uncontacted until like the 1960s. I want to say maybe maybe early 1970s that they had no real outside influences on them. Um, so it, it's it's very it's very easy that someone could live on these islands and just be completely disappear. Right, right. So uh, back to it. Quote: The Humboldt Current driving up from the south and the tides ebbing and flowing and being deflect, deflected and funneled by the obstructing islands probably create strong and uh, tricky currents in the channels between these islands. The prevailing winds blow off the open ocean onto the rocky shoreline. The combination of such currents and winds results in a coast that is highly dangerous to sailing vessels. So such ships have avoided these islands in the past, which is part of the reason why they have never been inhabited. My judgment is that this is no place for wind-powered vessels. Fuel-burning engines are a necessity. And yet a community aspiring to self-sufficiency wouldn't want to depend on outside supplies of gasoline or diesel fuel. So the ideal transportation solution seems to be a wood-burning steam-powered launch fueled with firewood from the abundant local forest. And quote. So that's what I was referring to. I can remember exactly where that was. But yeah, I mean, uh, the Humboldt Currents is uh, specifically, specifically what we're talking about here. And uh, that sounds like it would be uh, very, very dangerous. Uh, and uh, I think Jim's recommendation is good. You probably want uh, a motorized boat. Uh, as if, uh, you, I, I, like I said, I think it'd be really easy to get stuck in one of those channels uh, or in one of those coves. Oh, absolutely. With, without a power, 
I I don't see you getting out at all with without power. I mean, if you had, you know, theoretically, if you had this line line marriage set up, right, and you had 40 people with oars on your 60-foot boat and they were all rowing at the same time in the same direction, <laughs> maybe, maybe you could break the current and, and, and get over the waves and, and get out of these channels. <laughs> oh, oh, that's good. That's good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that pretty much settles settles that one. Uh, but yeah, I think that I think his point on yeah, if if the idea here, which which it is, complete self sufficiency, then uh, then yeah, the 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 source would have to be wood wood burning steam powered, uh, for for the boat. So, uh, I guess that would uh, also be a, another hurdle uh, heading towards uh, towards this hypothetical venture laid out by Rayo. So again, uh, let's let's get back to it. Quote: Another source of food not mentioned above would be the deer and other animals that abound in these rainforests and sea mammals on the coast. Small food animals such as rabbits can be uh, could be raised. Also, some proto agriculture could be practiced without comprising security. Food trees and bushes growing naturally could be encouraged with a little fertilizer and cutting back of competing vegetation. Other food trees could be planted here and there, etc. On these large islands with their high elevations and abundant rainfall, there would be ample water power to supply all domestic energy needs. Small hydropower systems could easily be concealed beneath the vegetation or even completely underground if that was deemed necessary. Running a repair business serving outsiders poses a much too serious threat to security, in my opinion. It would be better not to have that much contact with outsiders. Furthermore, that may not even succeed as a business venture, since about the only customers one could find on these shores would be a, scattered, a few scattered Indian villages. Members of a secret community probably should stay away from the few larger ports to avoid attracting the attention of some government functionary. A preferable alternative source of income would be from uh, selling furs from sea otters and fur seals, and we'll stop there. Yeah, as as we talked about a, a little bit ago, uh, probably easily get away with uh, with planting some stuff above ground. Um, next, uh, as we already said too, the hydro hydropower system seem to be a very very good alternative, uh, you know, for for power. So that's uh, you know that's that's a possibility. And then yeah, uh, <laughs> running a, a like a, a repair service. Uh, I mean, what's uh what wealth do you think some of these Indian tribes have if they even exist? And how are you going to find them in the first <laughs> place? Uh, so yeah, I think that's uh, not practical. I think you're uh, you're going to have a business with no, with uh, no clients uh, if that's uh, what you decide to do. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, that that doesn't seem like it's going to work too well. I mean, how do you find these tribes? How do you uh, find them? <laughs> uh, if you're in their forest, chances are they're going to find you long before right. you're ever going to find them. Uh, and I. I as as like a source of income, I don't see the repair business doing anything. Uh, as a source of barter, I see I see uh, a chance there of of um, acquiring some some you know fruits from further inland and and, and things like that, uh, or some pelts you know as they talked about sea, sea otters and and fur seals and whatnot. And you could as you could grow on the island you know, as we talked about during the summertime with with the way that the earth tilts they're going to have a lot of light down there and you could grow some good sized vegetables and 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 trade that with the with with the native tribes for you know fruits or or meat or whatever um so the opportunity is there for barter but running a repair business as like a money making venture i do not buy it at all no, and, and you consider these tribes have been there for pro probably probably quite a long time. Uh, it's not like they could you know call up uh, call up AAA and have them come fix their canoe, right? Uh, so I, I imagine they're pretty self sufficient in that regard. If they survive that long, that they would fix their own damn boat, or they'd fix their own oh, stuff. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's not including the fact that having them having motors to repair would be few and far between. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so that that seems like a, a dead mission there, except for except for the possibilities that you, that you brought up. But uh, anything else there? Uh, yeah, I, I want to go back to this this hydropower uh, with the, uh, the the water supply, um, especially nowadays. The the, the technology uh, for hydropower is is absolutely fantastic. Like you can set up like a five megawatt hydropower plant with a fifty five gallon barrel. Like, like they, they have the technology to do that now. Uh, and back then, you could do it um, uh, on a water wheel. You know, like uh, you see on, on the, the Tennessee River, uh, the, the picturesque with the water wheel. Right, yeah. That, ru that, that runs the belts for the sawmill and things like that. Like you could run one of those to an alternator 
run the alternator to charge the batteries and then use the batteries as the, as the supply as you needed them. Uh, so that's that's extremely possible. It's it's not only possible, it's, it's doable. People are doing it right now. Yeah, uh, homesteaders, easy. homesteaders, homesteaders are doing it right now. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a, a very easy alternative, I think, especially with the way technology's developed since Ray wrote that in 1969. Not that you couldn't do it then too. Uh, and especially especially with Rayo being the engineer he was and Jim Stump came up with some really interesting ideas. I think anyone that wanted to could come up with a hydropower uh, electric system, uh, you know, custom. Absolutely. All right, let's continue here. Um, all right, so back, yeah, back to it. Quote, in order for children to pass an outside society, more than just a knowledge of the language would be required. They would need to have a whole repertoire of skills, some quite subtle. They could only get these skills by living outside. Perhaps older children or young adults could go outside the school, uh, go outside to school or to work. But some of them will find the bright lights seductive and will not return. Those who do not return may have divided loyalties and be a security risk. All in all, I'd be inclined to avoid all contact with outside, with the outside, except for those people who specialize in import/export and going outside to buy, sell, or to gather information. I've lived in collective houses myself and seen friends experiment with group relationships. Based on that, I'm skeptical about the chances for success of line marriages or other unusual arrangements. The form I would rate most likely to succeed would be mostly monogamous unions within an extended family made up of numerous blood relatives and some persons adopted in, headed by a strong patriarch or matriarch. Young people could go out to find marriage partners who would be brought in, or better yet, children could be adopted and raised to be future marriage partners. That's preferable because children would be more easily socialized into this lifestyle than people who have grown to adulthood outside. Uh, the most secure arrangement would be for most marriages uh, to take place within the family, which would often mean between close relatives. First cousin mar marriages used to be much more common than they are now with no apparent harm. Bringing in new breeding individuals now and then should be enough to keep the gene pool from becoming harmfully inbred over many generations. Uh, I'll finish this last paragraph and we'll discuss. Uh, while variations of this lifestyle could be set up in many places, the islands of South Chile are particularly suitable because of their physical characteristics. Some additional advantages are being in the southern hemisphere, this region wouldn't suffer as much in the event of nuclear war than, uh, in the north. Also, these islands lie downward of a vast empty stretch of South Pacific and, and, and Antarctica, so the air quality must be moving must be among the cleanest in the world, and there would never be any nuclear explosions upwind to create a fallout problem, end quote. So, yeah, I think Jim's right. Uh, and he does have, uh, I think he was more of kind of the, well, I guess, in, I guess in looking at, you know, libertarianism, how it is now, uh, modern libertarianism, uh, yeah, Ray would have been, uh, you know, more of the left, left variety and, uh, definitely Jim too. He liked, he liked communes and co-ops. Uh, so, so yeah, Jim has some experience with these, uh, with these group relationships and, uh, <laughs> yeah, apparently he's skeptical of it just like we are. Uh, I have a huge, huge problem with Jim at this very moment. Uh, or better yet, children could be adopted and raised to be future marriage partners. Mm. Yeah, that's a big no, Jim. You can stick that idea where the sun don't shine. Uh, like that, that is that is not Vanu at all, right? Because you are you're coercing these children into providing your expectations of, of what they should be uh i have a huge huge problem with that it's a good point i didn't, um, I didn't even know I, I didn't really think of that part but yeah that's uh that doesn't really give the uh the child uh any autonomy or for the free will to make their own decisions oh absolutely not that is absolutely the complete opposite of everything that i believe freedom is um i i do like this part where he said uh uh uh, monogamous unions with an extended family member with numerous blood relatives. Uh, I think that if you had four, five, six couples uh, that were not related at all that live there and and they, for sake of the discussion, they believed in the in this line thing or or whatever else. But if if you had if you had four, five, six couples that were completely unrelated to each other. Uh, and they had kids, and then those kids were able to uh, grow up and, and have children of their own. Uh, like, I think that is a lot better, or, or the, the idea of this society existing is a lot better when you have more unrelated coming in initially, right? If you have yeah. numerous blood relatives, no. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, yeah, we're, it's, we're, it's, we're, it's we're getting into redneck territory here. 
uh, yeah. screwing cousins and such. Uh, <laughs> and even closer than that, un- unfortunately, in some circumstances. But yeah, this, I, I this think is you're right. chilly. This is chilly, not West Virginia. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, yeah, I, th- I think uh, you know that definitely uh, is is a, a better, uh, I guess, alternative. Uh, but still, I mean, just it it still seems way out there. I, I think the the only way this could be fe- the, the only way a, a Burrow Smith situation could be feasible if it's uh, you know like a Ray Roberta thing. Uh, and I think it would probably it probably wouldn't be a, a continuing thing. Uh, they would live out there in, until they die, and then it would just be you know uh, uninhabited again. Uh, I think that'd be the the most likely way for this to come in fruition. Because how the hell uh, are you going to can like uh, you know get uh, like like minded people you know finding finding you know anarchists you know here in Bloomington, Illinois is already difficult enough, right? So how in the hell are you going to find like uh, say four or five other couples? So eight to ten other people who are like-minded enough like you, and that want to actually pursue this this uh, very radical lifestyle change. Uh, I, I think that's uh, uh, you know as likely as the government being abolished tomorrow. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, an interesting thought experiment, I guess you could say. But uh, I, I want to make one more point here. Uh, you said uh, in order for children to pass in the outside society, more than just knowledge is, would be required. Uh, if you have if if you're you're in, in in this chilly area, right, and you have as you know perfect example four or five other couples, if you have a blue eyed blonde eyed blue hair blonde eyed ch- child, they're not gonna pass in the Chileans, you know the 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 Indian tribes down there. They're not. They're no. simply not gonna pass. You know that is not a that is not a trait that is common down there. Or e- or even smaller established uh, you know towns or cities. Uh, there's no oh, way in no. hell they would pass. So you, so you would have to you would have to have if if the goal is to be able to import export to both, uh, you know, uh, Anglo and Latin, uh, you know, uh, individuals, then uh, uh, Anglos and Latinos a better way to put it. Uh, then, yeah, I, I think uh, you're gonna have to find uh, not only four to five other couples, but you're gonna have to find uh, you know, say two or three Anglo couples and two or three uh, Latino couples. Uh, like you're, you're gonna have to, you're, you're gonna, to, you're, you're, yeah, you, you're exactly right. Blue eyed, blonde hair person, and uh, <laughs> down there in South Chile, yeah, yeah, not a chance. <laughs> Mowgli, Mowgli, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, oh man. So, uh, so, so I guess the the last paragraph is interesting too. Uh, you know, further, I guess, verifying the, uh, you know, the the prospects of South Chile for 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 a for a, for a Venuan. Uh, or maybe even a phony association. Wouldn't that be nuts if, if, if we provide all these, uh, you know, pretty simple strategies? Still, still lifestyle changes, still difficult, sure, but easier, easier ones like uh, minimal sailboating or uh, van nomadism, even. Uh, and uh, you know, people jump on board with the South Chile. I'd be, I'd be uh, really, really surprised. <laughs> that that would be, uh, I would, yeah, shocking is an understatement. <laughs> Shock yeah. would be at their statement. They would be stopped. Like, I, I, uh, I, 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 I think we'd probably retire the podcast and say, okay, guys, that's, that's, that's all. <laughs> we, we've accomplished any goals that we were going to accomplish. That's, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I do agree with what he says here in this last paragraph. You know, um, nuclear war. There, there's no, there's no cities of any size, right? As, as in 1970, the largest city down there was what, seven thousand? Uh, yeah, that would have been. That would be uh, Asin, or uh, um, there's a, a Malinka, I think is what it is. Malinka, maybe. Um, that would be towards the very northern portion of uh, you know these these islands in South Chile. So uh, yeah, yeah, so you this, would be this... yeah. So seven seven thousand and ten thousand people in, in 1970 would be like the highest population, and you're talking hundreds upon hundreds of miles away uh, from that. Yeah, six hundred mile long island chain. I think is what it said. So you have seven to ten thousand at the northern portion of six hundred miles of of island chain. There's uh, there's no cities. There's no universities. There's no hospitals. There's no large airports. There's no military bases that I know of. There's no government of any kind. You know, as we talked about before, the more people you have, the more government you have. Right, so the fewer people you have, the fewer government that you're going to run into. So this region, uh, by uh, in a, by the um, level of government, is even more quote vanu 
than the Siskiyou region, right? I mean, the Siskiyou region still has roads and, and logging and it has some small towns. Even the largest town here is only a little bit larger than some of the smallest towns that you'll run into in the Siskiyou region. Right, and, and even 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 so too. I mean, like uh, Malinka, yeah, that is the biggest, I guess, population center, and it's still, I, I, it, it still doesn't look, you know, big like a like a, a big city. It still looks like a small kind of port, uh, port town, I guess you could say. But even if even if you did want to have that ability to import and export, you don't have to get, you know, hundreds upon miles away of Malinka. So if you if if you want to be uh, mostly self sufficient but still have that import export, you could even go further north. Uh, and those islands are still uninhabited, but I'm looking at Google Earth now, and there are pictures um, from Malinka. So where, where Malinka is, there at kind of that northern point, um, there's a, a little bit of a passage that goes in between. There are pictures. People people do sail there. Uh, they do, uh, you know, take their boats there. So uh, so I guess you, you, I don't know how first how far how far south you'd have to go from Malinka, but uh, but yeah, you could even. Yeah, you, you could even, uh, you know, be closer to, say, Malinka or Guadicaca, Guadicas or whatever that uh, place is called, however you pronounce it, and uh, still have that import-export. So that is still a possibility. Uh, if you do want to have your, your underground structure and still be able to, uh, to, to trade. So I think that's an interesting, uh, an another interesting idea. But then again, uh, if you're looking at, like, the Burrow Smith example, if that's what you're trying to do, then uh, you might want to get as far away from any of those population centers as possible. And they're not too hard to avoid there in South Chile. I think if you're going after the Burrow Smith, you should sit down and reevaluate your life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, it, there are parts of it that are very feasible. Like, you can grow, you can grow underground gardens, right? We, we have... You can use uh, a passive solar, right? I mean, you could use mirrors to, to move sunlight down there. You can use uh, hydroponics. You can use UV lights, right? I mean, that very much exists. You can run these UV lights off of your uh, hydroelectric uh, um, uh, water wheel. Um, so it, it is very much possible. I seriously don't recommend it, though. Yeah. You will, I, I... You will, be, you will be starving quickly. Yeah, unless you're, uh, you know, probably even more, uh, uh, even more experienced than than Rhea was uh, toward, towards the end of uh, of his life. Uh, but yeah, I mean, th if, if this is something, I, I mean, honestly, Jason, I want to talk about this because it's a really interesting proposal, and I think it also, I think it further shows that some of these obscure libertarian publications, these people were hardcore as hell. Um, they po they left anything open to po open a possibility. And uh, you know, living on icebergs and such, that you know, like that, there were attempts at that uh, that I've been able to, to glean from these publications. Uh, so these people were extremely hardcore. Uh, so I, I think that's that's one important one important thing. And also, it just you know, if you just can't stand government that much, uh, you know, go move to South Chile. There's no government there. Uh, <laughs> there's def there's definitely not. There's definitely not. But again, there are a lot more feasible solutions. As I mentioned, van nomadism uh, being one. Uh, wilderness Vani in the, in the Siskiyou uh, is also much more feasible because you have that uh, ability to, for import-export, and the temperatures are definitely uh, more mild uh, than here in South Chile. There are a lot of uh, other, you know, very more practical solutions, but I thought this one was uh, just just fascinating, just fascinating. How much and how much uh, depth Jim went into uh, in this area? So uh, I guess uh, any closing thoughts there, Jason? I, I just I'm in amazement that that they go to this. That the the mind can go to this depth. I, I I have, I don't have the ability to put aside my natural concerns and 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 my knowledge and things like this. These, the some of the things that are that are mentioned in this are both by Jim and by Rayo, uh, just absolutely baffle me that it would enter their mind at all. <laughs> like yeah. I, I just. I, I almost I almost feel uncomfortable reading this. Not like physically uncomfortable, but like mentally uncomfortable. It's like I, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have an example. I, I, right. There's nothing that I can compare it to. It's just it, it it makes me feel uncomfortable to read this. To know that this very intelligent person that we know as Rayo would have an idea like this. It just it it doesn't make sense to me <laughs> no I, I i know exactly what you mean and uh when these uh when ocean uh, when ocean freedom notes comes out 
Yeah, I think uh, there'll be at least a couple more reactions of, of that because there was uh, there's there's a lot of talk about you know just these uninhabited ocean islands where you'd be crazy to try to you know go and live there. Like you would just you would be insane to try to try try to actually go and live there. But you know it's it's ta it's they're, they're talked about in depth. Kind of gives you all the information you you need to know, and all you have to do next is to go visit it. Uh, you know, take your boat out to some of the uh, you know the middle of the uh, Atlantic Ocean and, uh, you know, uh, trek out to that uh, island and see if it suits you. Uh, so, so I think, what, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, you've, you've, you've read at least a portion of Ocean Freedom Notes. Yeah, there are at least a few in instances of that where, you were, like, even, even the uh, mining uh, icebergs, like, that was, I was reading that and I was like, holy shit, okay. All right, then. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> they're very, very interesting publications and you will not find any of them today that are like that. Uh, you definitely won't. So even if, uh, a lot, even if some of the strategies proposed, or most of them, just uh, are are unfeasible for you in your life situation, or if, as Jason, they're just so crazy that you can't believe they're even being proposed, uh, <laughs> then then uh, you know at, at least for the entertainment value, uh, this is what this is what freedom pioneers uh, discussed uh, throughout the 1960s to about the uh, 1990s or the late 1980s. So uh, I guess something to keep in mind. Uh, you want to talk about people who actually wanted freedom. And then now today we've got all the uh, BS political crusading and uh, all of the nonsense that comes with collective movementism. So uh, I, I, they were serious. They were definitely serious about freedom, and that's uh, that's very clear. But uh, maybe serious to the point of, I don't know what the right word would be. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Ridiculous. Right. The, they, they, they have this I, I can understand the desire for freedom I have a strong desire for freedom myself I, I am making moves to become more free right to, to limit my coercion to get out of California like that's something I'm doing but to go live on an island in South Chile which is just barely above the, the you know the, the South Arctic Circle down there it's just it it <sighs> It doesn't make it does. I, I am baffled. Like my, as as a you know, my mind, my survivalism mind, my homesteading mind, uh, what I know about nature and things like that. This is a very, very, very hostile environment. Nature is unforgiving, right? Nature, nature doesn't take shit. And if you're going down there and you're not prepared at all, if if you are. If you are not 100% prepared, and I mean everything, if you do not have every single I dotted and every single tie crossed and, and you've signed your will and all that good stuff, it's, you're, you're, you're not going to make it. You're going to live there for a miserable year, uh, and then you're going to go home and go to McDonald's because you're, you're just not – you're not going to survive down there if you are not 100% committed. No, no. And, uh, and and there is that, uh, obviously, you know, freedom is absolutely important, but uh, kind of comfort, too. You want to enjoy your life. You don't want it to be, uh, you don't want to be free and miserable. Uh, I think that would kind of, uh, you know, at least defeat the purpose in some ways, right? So, um, you know, as I said, there, there are so, there are the strategies where you can kind of, uh, you know, a much better balance of, uh, of being comfortable and uh, also being free. Uh, so I, I think that's, uh, you know, a very good point to, to, to kind of end on. Uh, there is there is a balance here. I mean, no one's uh, Rhea wasn't asking you. Uh, we aren't asking you to you know give up everything to in pursuance of Vani. Definitely not. Definitely not. Um, there is a, there is a, a there is a balance, and with uh, with freedom, there is there is some some sacrifices um, that uh, that will need will that will need to be made. Uh, I would presume, but but still, th th this is this goes uh, this goes very far. <laughs> Definitely does. <laughs> to put it uh, I guess yeah. mildly. Yeah, life is too short to not be happy. Government does not make me happy, but neither does freezing in 40 mile an hour winds in a polyethylene tent. No, and not in South Chile, South Chile either, huh? Nope. That one's that one's uh, cross, you can cross that one off the list. It wasn't even on the list in the first place. <laughs> uh, the more I think about it, I think it could be done, but I am not one to do it. I do not like the cold, not that much. Right on, right on. So, so I guess that uh, I guess we'll we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up there. Uh, thanks for coming on as uh, as always, Jason. Fun discussion, and uh, and and I think there are other publications maybe that uh, mention South Chile. So we might uh, revisit this for entertainment purposes later on, but uh, we'll just uh, uh, we'll just have to see. So thanks a lot, Jason. 
Uh, no problem, Shane. Thanks for having me on again. Not a problem. So, uh, you know, make sure to go check out the website, bonniepodcast.com. And, uh, you know, the, there will be, uh, you know, newer publications released uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, so make sure, yeah, bonniepodcast.com. And, uh, you know, check the free books tab there at the top. I'll get I'll have them, I'll have them all updated there uh, for uh, for free download. So uh, make sure to keep a lookout for that. And uh, you can pick up uh, Vonny Book 2 right now, uh, vonniepodcast.com forward slash Vonny 2. And uh, make sure to subscribe to the podcast, share it around with your uh, friends and family, and uh, make sure to make sure to uh, at your next uh, Libertarian Party meeting, make sure to propose the idea that uh, you all should move to South Chile. Uh, well, actually, if you're listening to this podcast, you shouldn't be a political crusader, but uh, but I'd end on a little bit of a funny joke there. Uh, but I'm not really that funny, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that was that was good. That was good. Uh, and and uh, we'll, we will be getting back to uh, the normal episodes. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll be uh, you know uh, come Tuesday, or if it uh, will come. Uh, or if it, not sure if it'll come this Tuesday or if uh, the following one, but uh, we will get back to uh, the original season two material. So you have that to look forward to, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk to Kyle and see what uh, what was going on, uh, see how, how things are going for him. So uh, with that said, uh, we'll talk to you next week.